Welcome and thank you for joining our next in a series of Central Coast Focus webinars, informing and inspiring development of local clean energy and community resilience. In this webinar, we are exploring how local clean energy and community resilience hubs can help ensure continuous operation of critical facilities. This webinar is brought to you by Uniting the Central Coast for Action, a growing coalition working to create a resounding vo voice for climate leadership and resilience on the Central Coast. My name is Eric Viam. I chair the Slow Climate Coalition and I'm director of Uniting the Central Coast for Action. Today, we have a very exciting program planned for you. First, uh, we're lucky to receive an introduction to community microgrids by Craig Lewis, founder and executive director of the Clean Coalition. Then we'll, we'll uh, engage in two case studies. The first, uh, looking at Santa Barbara Unified School Districts uh, resilient microgrids with Desmond Ho, Operations and Sustainability Coordinator. The second is a very exciting project, the Redwood Coast Airport Microgrid, and we're joined by Jim Zolik, Principal Engineer at Schatz Energy Research Center at Humboldt State University. Then we'll be joined by Dr. Aaron Pierce, the Director of Cal Poly's Institute for Climate Leadership and Resilience. He'll be sharing some uh, exciting resources to support your organizations and communities in exploring potential opportunities around local clean energy and resilience. Then we're gonna shift into questions and answers. Uh, we, we request that you enter your questions into the chat when speakers are talking, and then we'll address as many of those questions as possible after the speakers have finished. The questions we don't get uh, a chance to address, we'll, we'll um, take note of and address to you in writing. And then uh, finally, we'll take a few minutes to solicit your feedback uh, on related topics for future workshops or other ways for us to work together to develop local clean energy and community resilience. Before we jump into our program, I wanna take a moment to thank all of our fantastic partner organizations who helped to make this webinar successful. Thank you so much. We deeply appreciate your partnership and look forward to continuing our work together to accelerate climate leadership and resilience on the Central Coast. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Craig Lewis, founder and executive director of the Clean Coalition, uh, who will be introducing us to community microgrids. Craig, uh, it's all yours, take it away. One moment, there we go. Okay, sorry about that. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and I am going to um, go through a presentation uh, that has a lot of slides and I just, you know, let everybody know these slides are freely available without any restrictions. So, um, you know, Eric and company, you all can share these slides with everybody who's registered for the event. The Clean Coalition will also have these up on our website on our events uh, webpage that we've created for this particular event. Um, and I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to, I'm going to define um, microgrids, the, the kind of the, 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 the variety of microgrids that, that exist out there in just a moment. Um, but uh, I just want to say that I'm going to be talking primarily about solar microgrids, like the ones that we're going to hear about from uh, the Santa Barbara Unified School District, because those are the ones that you can do today without, without, without the utilities getting in the way. And, um, and there are a few exceptions where we can do community microgrids, like what you're gonna hear about from Jim Zolik at, at, uh, around the uh, Redwood Coast Airport microgrid, which is the very best example of a true community microgrid that in existence. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have Jim uh, presenting today. Uh, but um, I'm gonna be talking about um, mostly solar microgrids. If I have time, uh, I will go into a couple of examples of some additional community microgrids that the Clean Coalition is working on. Um, the, uh, the, the, and, and the reason I'm gonna be talking about uh, microgrids so much and solar microgrids in particular is, is that they bring an unparalleled trifecta of economic, environmental and resilience benefits. Uh, and, and, and so um, you know, they, are, they are the right way to do things. So let me go into presentation mode here. Um, the Clean Coalition, very quickly, we are a nonprofit uh, organization, and our mission is to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid. 
Uh, we believe that we can get to 100% renewable energy and that we will get to 100% renewable energy. It's just a matter of whether it will take 10 years or 30 years. And, and, and obviously the Clean Coalition is, uh, we have a mission to accelerate that. So we're, we're aiming to get it on the, on the 10 year side of that spectrum. And when we get there, the Clean Coalition is very focused on making sure that we have at least 25% of the energy mix is coming from local renewable energy. And you need to have local in order to get the, that true trifecta of economic benefits coming to the communities, that economic stimulation. You want it in your communities um, in order to have the, 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 uh, the optimal uh, economic benefits. You need to avoid taking out pristine lands and open space, right? So you got to put this, you got to put your solar on rooftops and parking lots, uh, built environments, um, get a second use for those environments. Uh, and you need to avoid building transmission even through through pristine pristine lands. Um, and, and in order to have resilience, you have to have your energy locally. Um, if you don't have your energy locally, you're subjected to long supply lines, which inherently are not resilient. Um, okay, so uh, I was asked to define microgrids. So it, the easiest definitions of micro, a microgrid that I can come up with is it is a combination of energy resources, definitely including generation and energy storage resources that are coordinated to serve specified loads, including in an islanded fashion. Meaning if the broader grid goes down, you need your, your microgrid needs to be able to, need to continue operating. Um, now, a microgrid can be 100% off-grid, meaning it's never connected to the grid. That's, that is a microgrid. Um, most of what I think people in this audience are going to care about is, is the type of microgrid that is normally operating in parallel with the broader grid. But when the broader grid goes down, the microgrid continues to operate as, as, as it is designed to. Um, a solar microgrid is a behind the meter microgrid. So meaning that you have it on a specific site, your solar and your energy storage are connected behind the meter, not on the utility side of the meter, but on the customer side of the meter. Uh, and solely relies, a solar microgrid solely relies on solar for energy generation when islanded. Obviously, if a site is normally connected to the grid, then it is getting some of the energy from the grid during the night times, for example. Um, and it's pushing energy back out usually as well uh, to, to you know, basically the solar is usually connected on a net metering basis. Um, a hybrid solar microgrid is basically a solar microgrid that includes additional types of, of uh, energy generation. Um, typically that would be a diesel generator would be your, your additional uh, energy generator that would be in the mix of a, of a hybrid solar microgrid. And a community microgrid is a microgrid that covers a target grid area. So now we're talking about the actual grid and it relies on the existing distribution feeders, you know, at least one feeder, like you'll see in the, in the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid example that Jim will present, um, at least one feeder. And a feeder is basically power lines, right? They're distribution power lines. It's uh, when you see the wood power poles and you see the wires, the, those are power lines, right? That's a distribution feeder. Um, so you're, you're relying on existing distribution feeders um, to operate when islanded because you've got to get the energy from, you know, one side of the feeder down to key, for, you know, where you might be generating a bunch of your solar down the feeder to, you know, another one of your, um, uh, to one where your critical loads might be that you have to keep on. And so that you need that feeder to connect your, your energy generation with where you need that energy. Um, community microgrids typically include both front of meter uh, and behind the meter resources. Front of meter means it's on the utility side of a customer meter. Um, and, uh, and, and very often community microgrids include solar microgrids. So you can have a bunch of solar microgrids within a community microgrid, meaning you can have solar and storage behind meters that, can, that, that comprise solar microgrids and those would be part of your broader community microgrid. Um, uh, one of the important notes here on community microgrids is that they require effective participation from utilities, which uh, the utilities have mostly erected barriers uh, up to this point in time. There are, there are exceptions, and the best exception we've got is the community microgrid that Jim will be talking about up in um, at the Redwood uh, uh, at the, the, the RCAM, um, which we'll hear about from Jim later. 
So I just want to touch on the value of resilience depends on the tier of load. So all loads aren't created equal. If you think about your home, um, the refrigerator is probably number one, then your communications, you know, your access to the internet's number two. And obviously you need some plug loads to keep your computers and your phones charged at home, right? So those, those are included in that. And then you could just go down the list and kind of rank, force rank your loads. It's the same thing at any facility, right? You're talking about the, the fire department, the dispatch center is the number one load. That can't go down, otherwise they can't coordinate their fire resources. Um, uh, so, so load tiering is super important. You have to know what are your tier one loads. Those should never, ever turn off. What are your tier two loads? Those should rarely turn off only if you absolutely need to, to preserve your, your energy for your tier one loads. And then your tier three loads are everything else. And a solar microgrid provides unparalleled resilience. This is what a typical solar microgrid will provide. This is, this is a solar microgrid that was designed for UCSB. And basically, we can keep 10% of the loads on forever. We can keep an additional 15% of the loads on for at least 80% of the time. And we keep the rest of the loads, 75% of the loads on for at least 25% of the time. And I just want to compare this. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of folks here from, from various municipalities. And the Clean Coalition works with, you know, cities and counties and fire districts, school districts, et cetera. Um, typically, uh, diesel generators provide two days of fuel supply for 25% of the load. So they cover tier one and tier two loads only, and they only have two days of fuel supply on hand. Two days go by, your light's out. The whole site is gone. So uh, this little red rectangle shows the resilience you get from a, from a diesel microgrid uh, and compares it to what you get from a solar microgrid that is properly designed. And that's what you get in all that shaded area there. Um, I know we've got, uh, I know we're going to hear about the Santa Barbara Unified School District. So I just want to uh, touch on it because the Clean Coalition was the instigator of getting that, those projects going. We, we took the, we basically did a uh, feasibility study on our own uh, of how much solar we get on all the, all the uh, Santa Barbara Unified School District sites. And, and, and obviously we wanted to do those as solar microgrids. So adding in the storage as well, we took that to the superintendent of the district. Um, got the, the superintendent interested in proceeding, and then we got engaged to do the feasibility studies, run the RFP, select the winners, and, uh, and, and get, that, they get those projects contracted. So um, there's 21 sites across the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Uh, we were able to identify 14 of those that made economic sense to move forward with, with either solar and or solar and storage in the form of solar microgrids. And this is kind of a status sheet of where those are all at. They, are, uh, they, they were, we did the feasibility study, we got them contracted uh, and they're right now under construction. Half these projects are almost fully constructed. Um, and it's really fun to drive around Santa Barbara and, and see these projects in, 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 in their full colors. Um, the projects that I'm most uh, excited about are the six projects that are full solar microgrids. These are the three big high schools, the Central Food Warehouse, the district office, and one of the junior highs. And these, pro these, these particular sites will have refrigerators or freezers that never, ever turn off. Uh, they will also have communication systems that never turn off. And, and the areas that are used for staging for emergency restoration and for um, even emergency sheltering, um, those, they, there will be lights and plug loads in those areas that will, will never go off. Um, and then the rest of the, the rest of the loads will stay on for significant percentages of time as well, as I was talking about on those slides where I talked about tier two and tier three loads. Um, the beautiful thing here is that the school district is going to save almost $8 million in guaranteed bill savings over the 28 year um, uh, duration of these power purchase agreements, which is the way that the contracts were constructed. It's third party uh, came in, paid 100% of the upfront costs. Um, is responsible for owning and operating the systems and delivering the energy to the school district, you know, to each of the sites of the school district. School district only pays for delivered energy. Does not, if energy doesn't show up, there is no cost. <laughs> uh, so obviously the party that owns these projects is very incentivized to make sure that everything's working properly. Um, and then in addition to those guaranteed bill savings, the school district will also get uh, almost six and a half million dollars in, in um, resilience value. In other words, if they wanted to get the same level of resilience from diesel generators, they would have to spend six and a half million dollars to get it. So in total, the school district gets about $15 million of, of value 
for these uh, for these uh, solar microgrids and solar projects that they didn't have to come up with any upfront capital to to get. It's a it's just a pure win. Um, so solar microgrids deliver an unparalleled level of resilience. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Eric uh, VM or somebody, one of the organizers, how much time do I have left just so I, I can know when to stop? And I'll, I'll keep talking until I hear from them, but um, I know I'm going to run out of time. Yeah. Four minutes. How many? Four. Okay. Thank you. So solar microgrids, unparalleled level of resilience. So we're working with a, a large agricultural facility up in Northern California. Um, this is uh, basically a look at the, 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 the load they have is in gray. That's over the course of a year. That's the profile of the load. The solar that's going to get generated is shown in yellow. You can see there's a very nice match between solar generation and their, their particular load at their facility. Um, what this chart shows is a lot of information on it. I just want you to focus on the upper on the right hand chart. Um, what's in uh, that brownish color is the amount of diesel that you would have to use when the grid goes down. If the grid was down for an entire year, <laughs> an entire year, the grid's down, you would have to if we keep 100% of the load on. You would have to use uh, about 30% of your uh, load would have to come from diesel, which would require 57,000 gallons of diesel, by the way, over the course of the year, you'd have to replenish your tank like hundreds of times. Um, it's not going to happen. So what you actually design for is, in their case, the critical loads are 30% of their loads. And if we only guarantee that we're going to keep 30% of the loads on 100% of the time, then what the diesel amount that you need is only 0.4%. So if you look at the right-hand chart here, you'll see just a couple splotches of brown. Those are the only times you need to turn those dirty, stinky diesels on. And in fact, it's so little that we could design those diesels out because we can definitely turn a few loads off as we need to, to make up that 0.4% of the load that the diesels would be required to carry. And only 30% of the site's loads are critical, right? So only 30% need to be on 100% of the time. The other loads can be on as, 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 as solar energy is available. Um, I just want to make a point that diesel uh, that that electric vehicle charging is can be a critical load. It can also be a, a way to uh, optimize economics. So in order to do that, you have to have behind the meter uh, uh, configuration of your EV charging infrastructure. If you go with a charge ready program in Southern California Edison or whatever PG&E's version of that is, where they come in and they they do the the EV charging, it has its own meter. It will not be supported by a solar microgrid. Grid goes down, that EV charging is not accessible. There is no energy that's gonna be going into those EV chargers. So if you wanna have uh, resilience to your EV charging infrastructure, you need to design it behind the meter and you need to design it very intelligently. And th this chart, all these, this whole presentation is available to everybody uh, without restrictions. So you can come and start study the slides as you want to. But this chart basically shows that um, in the weekdays, this is for a typical commercial or you know, even like a community, um, like a municipality, town center type of thing. Um, the, the green is your weekday charging profile, average charging profile on an average charging port. The brown curve on the bottom is, is, is the weekend utilization. And that purple line says that, hey, for economic reasons, sometimes you may not want to just make charging completely available at full speed, right? So you can put whatever charging profile you want on it in order to make sure that your economics are, are optimized. At the same time, you make sure that it's designed behind the meter so you can deliver energy to it through your solar microgrid when the broader grid is down and keep those emergency vehicles charged. And when you have plenty of solar availability, you keep you can make it available to the, you know, the wider community, make sure that they can keep their electric vehicles charged as well. But it's really important that you design some of your electric vehicle charging infrastructure behind the meter. Um, and I, I've got a bunch of other slides here on, that kind of touch into community microgrids. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, Eric, because I know that I'm going to go over time if I start digging into this. So I'll stop and make sure there's time for everybody else. Thank you so much for that, and uh, really appreciate that introductory presentation. Um, I think we're, there's a lot of great questions that are coming in, and I think with the, the pace that we're going, we're going to have lots of time for discussion and questions, so we'll, we'll be able to bring more of that information to bear uh, towards the end of the presentation. So thank you, Craig. Uh, now it's my pleasure to bring in Jim Zolik. 
excuse me, uh, before Jim, we're going to bring in Desmond Ho, Operations and Sustainability Coordinator of Santa Barbara Unified School District, to go deeper into the presentation that Greg touched on um, uh, around microgrids, uh, solar microgrids at Santa Barbara Unified School District. So Desmond, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. All right, can everybody see that okay? All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for having me today. Again, my name is Desmond Ho, and I am the Operations and Sustainability Coordinator for the Santa Barbara Unified School District. Um, so in today's webinar, I'm going to put a brief overview of the solar and microgrid project that is under construction at Santa Barbara Unified, um, the partnerships, and then the energy resilience um, that's offered by the microgrid project, and then, of course, the financial side, which is what everyone is curious about. Um, so a brief look at what Santa Barbara Unified School District as, uh, um, as a whole. We are a district that serves approximately 14,000 students across 12 elementary schools, four junior high schools, and five high schools. Um, we have over 1,000 teachers and staff members, and almost, um, I'm sorry, almost half of our student population qualifies for free or reduced meals. That means that approximately 7,000 students may rely on the schools for their breakfast and lunch daily. Um, and the picture here is actually one of our um, junior high schools with the, the services a very large population and we'll be having one of the solar shade projects on the field. So how did the school district get to where we are today? So I'm gonna provide a very, very, very simplified roadmap of the process. Um, to begin, there needs to be a desire from the district level, um, especially on the leadership level to get clean energy and to be willing to invest in the future. Um, so th thank you. Thanks to the superintendents and board members that are forward thinking, the process began in 2019 um, by an approval of the contract to get the scoping and feasibility study done. And then once that study was finished, vetted and presented to the board, um, it was approved in 2020 to move forward with basically getting an RFP and then also to go with a power purchase agreement subsequently. Um, and then to begin getting the California's Division of State Architects approval for the projects. So after the DSA approves the plans, um, construction materials, building contractors have to be procured. And once construction is complete, the final step is to get that permission to operate um, from the Southern California Edison or whoever your utility providers may be. Um, so we were extremely fortunate to have Sage Energy Consulting along with uh, the Clean Coalition on board to help our district out with determining what is the critical and, and the different types of loads that we have are what size of PV panels that we need and the battery storage that's gonna be appropriate for each of the site. And then they're also, they also helped us out with um, determining project details and what other parameters that we might not have known about, such as the performance guaranteed agreements, which guarantees the amount of energy that's being generated by the panels and also the storage capacity of the batteries so that we know that we will be offsetting as much of the energy as we are supposed to get. Um, Sage Energy Consulting and also the Clean Coalition um, kind of help us put together the RFPs so that they're using the exact specifications and the contract language um, that we need because um, this is especially important in the school district world um, due to the rules bound by the California Uniform Public Construction Act, Cost Accounting Act, or CUPCA for short. Um, and under CUPCA, the contract usually goes to the lowest responsible bidder and what that means is that unless you spell out exactly what you want, um, the lowest bidder may be able to put in components that differ from what the original plans um, are on. So, and I also note that the construction contracts are done with prevailing wage. So you have seen this graphic from uh, Craig's presentation earlier. Um, so what did Sage Consultants and also Clean Coalition determine to be our um, tiered loads? So we have that tier one, the critical sustaining load. And for us, it's gonna be our freezers and refrigerators. As you'll recall, we serve up to between seven to 14,000 students a day, um, many of whom are, do rely on us for food. Um, and those large freezers and refrigerators store our food items. Now with the increasing frequency of the public safety power shutoffs or the PSPS, if you live in Southern California, um, there could be scenarios where we may lose power for several days at a time. Now, in addition to losing significant amount of food, if those uh, freezers and refrigerators lose power, 
We also lose the ability to feed the students that rely on the school districts for their meals. Now, depending on, on school meals, for schools for meals have become even more important due to the economic impacts that COVID-19 have had on families. Now for the school district office, um, like Greg was saying, the micro kit system will power our central communication equipment and allow the district to maintain communication with students, families, and staff. With our six micro grid system combined with the PV panels, it is expected that we'll maintain this tier one equipment 100% of the time. Now, in terms of tier two, um, those are gonna be our facilities such as the multi-purpose rooms and gyms at our high schools, um, and as well as the on-site communication kind of fall into the second tier. Um, the MPRs, and, or sorry, multi-purpose rooms or MPRs, um, associated lighting and HVAC could be potentially used to serve the uh, community in the event of the PSPS or any other emergency events. Um, and we're thinking that in this case, it's gonna be our three high schools since they have the largest facilities. And our system is going to be um, designed to maintain that 80% uptime as we talked about in tier two loads. Um, finally, for everything else, computers, um, you know, like I, like I said earlier, we're expected 25% uptime. So <clears throat> I think the cool thing is that the management system that will be installed at each of those microgrid sites will have the ability to kind of differentiate between these two loads or different loads. So then it's easier for us to determine what kind of support that we can uh, provide during outages. Um, we've been kind of in talks with the County of Santa Barbara. They've been asking us about what kind of support that we can provide. So once these are all complete, we have a better understanding of what's what. <clears throat> so I've talked a lot about the background. So here's are the actual projects. Um, in the end, uh, Santa Barbara Unified determined that a power purchase agreement will be the financially best fit for us because it requires little to no upfront investment and the ownership and maintenance of the panels batteries and the associated equipment will be done by our third party um, provider, which is NG. And with the power purchase agreement, the 14 sites will receive shade structures and six of those sites will have microgrids installed. Now we ultimately did not choose to install microgrids at all sites, primarily due to the increased costs and then also the limited energy that's being used by the small sites such as the elementary schools just did not make it financially feasible. Now, the shade structures are targeted for parking lots whenever feasible so that it could provide shade for the vehicles. And it's also gonna be pre-wired for EV charging stations. Um, for our elementary schools, unfortunately, the parking lots proved to be too small for the panels that we need. Um, so the shade structures had to go over playgrounds and or fields. Now, the upside is that during the hotter months of the year, this is gonna provide shading for students. This whole project is gonna provide approximately 70% of San Barbara Unified's overall electricity use. And then for each site with their own either uh, PV panels and or microgrid, it's gonna provide between 90 to 95% of that site's electricity. And the great thing is that it's going to offset about 93% of our greenhouse gas emissions from utility energy electricity use. So picture right here is uh, a picture I took last week of the PV panels that are installed at La Colina High, Junior High School. Um, as of today, so it's almost complete and the staff are already so happy that they're able to park the cars underneath and because that parking lot is usually scorching hot um, nine months out of the year. <clears throat> so uh, Craig already go through, went through this, our different grids, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I'm gonna go skip ahead. <clears throat> and in terms of our power purchase agreement, it is for 28 years and the electricity will be purchased at a flat rate during that time. Um, the great thing about this is that when this was calculated, they hadn't accounted for the uh, crazy, well, amount that our electricity has gone up um, just during COVID. Um, our rates have you know, doubled and then gone down a little bit and it's been highly volatile. Um, <clears throat> now the district is what initially incurred an upfront cost of $1.2 million for the feasibility studies, design review and contractual reviews. Um, and then all of that um, basically is going to be reimbursed. Um, and then it will also have no upfront capital costs as a system of that size is expected to cost about, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Now the district has the ability to buy out the system at the predetermined intervals. And then once this whole 28 year uh, agreement is complete, the district will um, own and operate the entire system. So over 28 years, we're expected to save $7.7 million. And this is not including that resiliency that Greg talked about earlier. Um, and this is gonna be, I think only gonna get more as 
there's like increasing wildfires and also the increasing impacts of climate change are to be seen. So where are we today? Um, we're extremely fortunate that when we began this project, we began procuring uh, construction materials during the beginning of the pandemic before the supply chain issues became a big problem. Um, while we were able to procure the bulk of the materials, we are still facing supply chain issues today, as well as labor shortages. Therefore, our projects have been delayed. Um, since there are so many sites, we've had to do construction in groups. Now, in order to, um, something to think about if you're a school district, you wanna minimize the site disturbance as much as possible. So the high schools were actually pushed out to the summers because it would minimize that impact to students and especially parking. And I'm sure all of you remember how coveted it was to get your driver's license when you're 16 and drive your car to high school. So we wanna make sure that we minimize that impact. Um, and we also have also had to shuffle um, around different projects because there could be con uh, concurrent construction projects to limit access, or it might just be too much disturbance for one site. Um, other delays, you know, um, getting Southern California Edison to put in a transformer that's suitable for our system and having to wait for them um, is something that definitely is delaying us and one of our microgrids. Um, however, with all this being said, we do we are anticipating the projects will finish construction by the end of 2022, and then hopefully everything will be fully operational by the first quarter of 2023. So um, thank you very much. Um, for, thank you, everyone, for your time and attention. Um, here's my contact information, and please feel free to reach out with any questions. Thank you, Desmond. Excellent presentation. Extremely clear. Uh, just a couple of things I want to highlight from the presentation that I was left with. One is uh, the that this was all paid for effectively through a 28-year hedge on, electri on, on increasing electricity prices. And so this is affordable, even the investments made by the jurisdiction to uh, for, for RFPs and for plan reviews is being uh, recouped. So the financial story, I think, is extremely compelling. And in addition to that, the co-benefits, like somewhat unanticipated co-benefits, such as uh, the, the, the shade structures that increase uh, you know, cool, cooler vehicles for staff, places for students to hide when it's really hot outside, just lots of uh, value there that's not, not taken into consideration in the financial pro forma. So again, thank you, Desmond. Uh, really appreciate your work on this, a very exciting project. Now oh, we're going to shift over to our next case study, which is uh, on the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jim Zolik, the principal engineer at Schatz Energy Research Center. The Great, floor thank is you, yours, Jim. Thank you, Eric. And let's see here, I will share my screen. Can people see that? Yes. Great. Well, first of all, um, thanks for the opportunity to be, meet with you all today and, and share uh, information about the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid project. And thanks also to Desmond and Craig for your um, great presentations. Um, and I think it, it set me up. I think that you'll see some parallels. Um, you'll also see, you know, I, I'm very excited about our project. It's, it's tremendously exciting and it, it really does pave the way for um, a new opportunity for community microgrids. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the, what Greg talked about in terms of different types of microgrids. Um, I also will highlight a lot of the challenges that we've faced. And, and I think some of those challenges will be a bit easier for projects that follow us because this project has actually established some new tariffs and, and processes and procedures and programs that, that uh, following projects, projects that follow on can, can sort of follow an, uh, an established path. But that said, um, these, these front of the meter uh, multi-customer microgrids are challenging um, and, and I'll, you'll, you'll, kind of, you'll hear that as I go. So, um, you know, trying, not trying to discourage people, but also trying to be very uh, realistic so that people kind of get a sense of, of what these projects are like. Um, so I'm, uh, again, I am a principal engineer at the Schatz Energy Research Center. I've worked there for, uh, I don't know, 26 some odd years, I think. The center's been around uh, for over 30 years now. Um, we are now part of Cal Poly Humboldt, and it's exciting to say that uh, we've been Humboldt State University um, as part of this Cal State University system. We are still part of the Cal State University system, 
but we are now a sister uh, Cal Poly to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and to Cal Poly uh, Pomona. So uh, that's, uh, th and that's just happened within the last few weeks. It's been in the works for, for a few years now, but um, so, and that, that'll bring up some interesting and exciting opportunities. I think there's gonna be a new energy program uh, in the engineering program, uh, in a, a, a specific major and, um, uh, and, and some, some interesting new opportunities, I think for the SHOT Center for, for growth and development in, in this area. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid and really about some lessons learned for the deployment of front of the meter multi-customer microgrids. So first of all, and Greg, this will be a, a, a little uh, parallel to what some of what Greg, uh, Craig did earlier. Um, so this is, this is a uh, definition from the uh, U.S. Department of Energy as to what a microgrid is, a group of interconnected loads and distributed energy resources, so basically loads and generation. And when you island, that generation needs to be able to match the loads and, 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 and serve those loads uh, with clearly defined electrical boundaries that act as a single controllable entity and can, and can connect and disconnect from, from, the, from the main grid. Um, some people also, there are you know, sort of remote microgrids that, that just stand alone, but uh, we're talking about microgrids that can connect and disconnect from the bulk grid um, and therefore operate in both grid connected and island mode. Um, and you know, I think one of the things that uh, that I wanted to, to bring up here with regard to microgrids, it's 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 a it's a pretty new area that that there's a lot of excitement and a lot of discussion and a lot of work happening. Um, you know, but I think it's really important to step back when when we start talking about microgrids, specifically for for a given community, to to determine what your goals and objectives are, and determine you know is a microgrid really the best solution for you? And I and it's not necessarily always going to be the best solution. Um, there may be, if you're, if you're looking for resilience, which is typically one of the important benefits of a microgrid, um, there may be other ways to achieve resilience. And so, and I know that, you know, the utilities, um, I know with, we work a lot with PG&E on, 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 this, pro, on this project, um, and I know the programs that they've developed kind of coming out of our project, you know, ask this question. And they don't try to, they're not trying to steer people away from it, but um, there may be, you know, undergrounding or sectionalizing and things like that. Um, may, may also be an option. So that's something really you, a community would need to discuss with their distribution system operator. Um, okay, let's see, make sure, oh, what's going on here? Oh, there we go, I think, no, all right. Yeah, okay. So let's say you've decided that a microgrid is uh, the right solution for you. Then the question is, what type of microgrid do you need? And, and this again, tees off of some things that, uh, that Craig was, was talking about. So the, the most the simplest microgrid is a behind the meter microgrid, uh, and and the diagram here on the right you see the utility grid, you see a transformer that uh, and you know so your your transformer is connected to the grid serving uh, the customer's retail meter, and then downstream of the meter on the customer side of the meter you have retail load, which is obviously the way all of our systems are set up, and in some cases we have behind the meter grid uh, behind the meter DERs solar solar and solar and batteries usually interconnected through the NEM tariff so that we get the retail value of that system. Um, and they, so it's possible for those resources to be grid forming and be able to then island uh, that, that um, load when, so the POI, the point of interconnection or point of isolation, the microgrid islanding point, when that switch opens, it isolates the, that generation and load from the main utility grid. Um, and so everything's behind the meter. That's a pretty simple system. There's not a lot of involvement from the utility. It's pretty much the same as interconnecting any DER. However, because it's uh, the DER is can be grid forming, there is you know some some additional safeties and and um, checks that the univer that the that the utility wants to make sure are in place because they don't want a grid forming generator operating in parallel with their uh, with their distribution system. Okay, so. The next, uh, next diagram here is a little more complicated. So this is a community microgrid, a, a multi-customer microgrid. And um, I, a lot of times we talk about it as a front of the meter microgrid. And I'd actually point to the point of isolation or point of interconnection for the microgrid as being behind the meter or in front of the meter. In, in, in the previous uh, slide there that I gave, you can see that the point of, of interconnection or point of isolation is on the customer side of the meter. In, in this diagram, that point of isolation is on the utility side of a, of a number of retail meters. So when this, this switch opens, 
there are a number of retail accounts. There may be, you know, there may be, uh, there may be numerous accounts off of a given transformer or a transformer per account, but you see a transformer, a customer meter, and a bunch of different accounts with retail load. And then you might also have both wholesale, uh, wholesale um, uh, DERs and retail NEM DERs. Uh, so the retail NEM DERs are gonna be behind a retail meter along with retail load. A wholesale grid forming DER is also behind a meter, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's for wholesale participation, not retail participation. Um, the one, uh, one last thing here, and so this is the, the RCAM microgrid that I'll talk more about here in a moment. One other point is that there's only one point of isolation or one point of interconnection for this microgrid to the utilities grid. And that, sim that makes this a bit simpler. It's basically an end of the line microgrid. The next case is a bit more complicated again. And you know, depending on where you need the resilience and where, you're, where you have the ability to put in solar and batteries, et cetera, is really gonna determine where, where you're located on the grid. Um, in this case, and it could, there could be more, you know, there could be more points of isolation, but in this case, I'm showing for the same diagram as before, two points of isolation. So this is a mid feeder community microgrid. And now you have two points of isolation and this complicates the controls, the protection, um, in particular, the transitions. So our, our microgrid is designed to be seamless transitions. Basically, there's no, nothing more than a flicker of the lights, if that, even in an unplanned outage or unplanned transition. Um, but there's also break, break before make transitions where you have an outage and then a black start. And my understanding is that if you have multiple points of interconnection, a make before break um, uh, transition is, is easier to accomplish. So if you are in a mid feeder situation and are looking for multi-customer microgrid, you just need to be you know, aware that, that that does complicate the, the process somewhat. Um, again, these are, you know, these are new, uh, this, is a new, this is a new area for the utilities and for community energy folks. And so it's, uh, you know, the, the, the simpler you can keep it, the better. Okay, so for RPM, um, we're the first front of the meter multi-customer microgrid in pg and &E's service territory. I think we are the first front of the meter multi-customer microgrid in California that is not owned by a, a utility. Um, you know, there's the Borrego Springs project, which is owned by uh, San Diego Gas and Electric. If the utility owns everything, that, that sort of, you know, it simplifies things in terms of contractually and, and, and for, you know, for a lot of other reasons. So um, in this case, the grid forming generation is owned by a CCA, but the distribution system, when we island, is still owned and operated by the, the distribution system operator. Um, so our project is 100% renewable, utilizing PV and battery. It does, the, the, the key critical facilities do have backup generators that are on standard automatic transfer switches, and those now are just deep backup. If, if we run out of PV and battery power in a long outage, then those backup generators could, could be called into service. Um, so it's 2.2 megawatts of PV, DC coupled to 2.2 megawatts, uh, a four hour, 8.8 .8 megawatt hour battery. And then there's an additional 300 kW of behind the meter NEM PV. Uh, as I mentioned, it's end of the line, serves 20 customer meters, including the air, regional airport and the U.S. Coast Guard sector Humboldt Bay Air Station, which are critical facilities. I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. It's a partnership between our distribution system operator, PG&E, and uh, our local CCA, the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. It's an $11.6 million project funded in part uh, by the California Energy Commission's EPIC program, and over half of the, the cost of the project is being covered by the Redwood Coast Energy Authority. So here's a picture to the left. Uh, the project is installed. And so the picture to the left shows you about seven acres of PV. We're looking at the back of the, of the modules. Um, they're actually bifacial modules, so they're active on both sides. Um, and then you see three Tesla power packs. Uh, and in front of those, you see a, a 2.3 MVA transformer. Uh, and then to the right, you see where we're located on the distribution circuit. So um, that's the end of, the, of a spur of the James Creek 1103 distribution circuit. You can see the California Redwood Coast Air, uh, Humboldt County Airport. And then uh, at the end of that, of that line, it's kind of the end of the road and the end of the, trans, uh, the distribution line is, uh, you see CB Road there is where the uh, Coast Guard station is located. In terms of uh, project status, this project is fully constructed and fully approved and operational for grid connected operation. Um, we've been participating in the Kaiso wholesale market uh, since just before Christmas. This is so far we've just participated in energy, both uh, day ahead and real time energy uh, energy markets. We will be uh, 
fairly soon participating in the ancillary services market as well for regulation up and regulation down. Um, as far as islanded operation, we are still in the commissioning process. We, uh, the week before last, we had some, some uh, like 12 midnight to 5 a.m. Uh, operational testing at the site for a couple of nights. Um, we did uh, we did identify some some uh, some software and hardware issues. Uh, we uh, we troubleshot those, figured out what was what what the issues were, have uh, have uh, rectified those, and uh, we will be commis uh, doing commissioning again this week with with PG e and our other partners, and hope to be. Uh, you know, fully operational for islanded mode this month and have an executed uh, microgrid operating agreement and full approval for islanded operation uh, next month in, in March. And then I think, as I mentioned, uh, I'm not sure if all of you were on, but we were planning a grand opening uh, tentatively around Earth Day in, in April. Um, key project partners, I'm not going to go through all these, but the Shots Energy Research Center uh, were the prime contractor and the owner's engineer for the Redwood Coast Energy Authority have worked very closely with PG&E and RCEA, um, as well as our key vendors, um, Tesla on the battery and PV system, and Schweitzer Engineering Labs on the controls and communication hardware and software. And, and uh, we have folks from, from each of those entities uh, will be on site for the commissioning testing that we're doing uh, later this week. Um, and then I also mentioned the, the Energy Authority is our, is our CAISO scheduler for the wholesale market participation. So why was the RCAM project install, uh, installed? You know, why was this project conceived of? Well, um, you know, as, as Craig said, you know, getting resilience to our communities, you need to have local renewable energy projects, local energy projects, and, and really, I think going forward, local renewable energy projects to provide that resilience. Um, CCAs, you know, throughout the state have goals for providing their, their uh, customers with renewable energy and for developing at least some local renewable energy projects. RCEA is no different. They have, um, you know, uh, ambitious goals in those areas. Uh, they want to provide renewable energy to their customers. They would like to, to meet some of their resource adequacy needs. I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a moment. Um, they would like to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. They'd like, as, Greg, as Craig said, create local jobs and provide resilience. Um, Humboldt County, you can see the, the map to the, to the right there and the location of the RCAM project just north of Humboldt Bay. Um, you know, Humboldt County is pretty remote part of California, um, it, it, somewhat isolated and can be um, uh, more isolated when, when we lose some of our, of our infrastructure. Um, and it's at risk to a number of, of natural uh, hazards. Um, limited highway access, and it's not uncommon for the highways to get shut down due to rock slides, mud slides, uh, fires, et cetera. We can become pretty isolated getting in and out of the county. Same thing with our electricity transmission and natural gas transmission. Uh, there's a single natural gas line. You can see there's 200, 215 kV transmission lines that come from the Central Valley to serve the Humboldt Bay area. Um, and uh, we're susceptible to earthquakes, tsunami, flood, and, and, and fires. Um, and so the airport and Coast Guard, critical facilities, um, and really our lifeline in, 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 the, in, the, in the case of a, a serious natural disaster where we could be out of power for, for, for weeks, literally, if we had the 9.0 earthquake and tsunami like happened in Japan, we could be out for weeks here. Um, and back in 1964, they, there was a, what they called the Christmas flood of 64 that really wiped out the North Coast and, and, and up into Oregon. Um, and, and the way that they got services, critical services in and out of the county was, was via the airport and the Coast Guard station. And not only in and out of the county, but then we're able to distribute those, those services and resources around the county. So really critical facilities for us um, here on the North Coast. So that leads to the business model. And, and, um, and, and, and now I'll, I'll start to talk, um, starting with the business model about some of the challenges um, for projects like these. Um, the so I, ideally you'd like your 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 blue sky revenues. Um, so you know blue sky operation for a microgrid hopefully is going to be 99 plus percent of the time. Hopefully you're not operating very many hours in, in island mode. Hopefully there's not you know a lot of out power outages and disasters and so forth that you need to respond to. They they do happen and you're glad you have it when you need it. But most of the time you're you're grid connected. Um, if it's if it's a NEM system you're you're offsetting your retail your retail bills. If it's a wholesale system, you're participating in the wholesale market and generating revenues. 
Um, the expected market revenues, and, and, and this will be, you know, this will prove itself out. We're, we're now participating in the market, and, and these were our initial estimates. They will be updated uh, probably within the next year. Um, but our, our initial expected market revenues were that, our, that, that the blue sky revenues would cover about half of the cost of the project, a little over $10 million, about half of that, about $5 million in, in, um, in, in blue sky revenues. The rest of it really then is the value of resilience, and, and we consider it an insurance policy for the reasons I just mentioned. Um, you can see this chart on the, on the, on the right. Um, you can see the, the, the bulk of the cost, so the cost to the, to the, to the far right. In yellow, the, the bulk of the cost being the, the distributed energy resources. Um, and then you can see the benefits and they stack up there to up to the brown bar, um, that being about half of the, the blue sky revenues. And then the, the red box on top of that was um, our, our, our partner, um, TRC Companies has done a business model analysis and in doing some additional work. Um, that was based on a typical outage that's the historical outage of, of like 18 hours per year for our region. Um, and so they use some various uh, standardized tools, you know, the safety and, and safety me uh, metrics and things like that. Um, the cost of, of uh, loss of loss of power cost calculator, I forget, it's like a, an LBNL calculator. In any event, they use these standardized tools and that's that, that red box. The, the dash line is, is the gap, but what they also did is they looked at what, is, what about an extended outage? What about a two week outage? And they use a FEMA cost calculator for something like that. And that actually took the project up and over a benefit cost of, of, of ratio of one. So, you know, the, the resilience here in this case is, is about half the value. Um, to be economically viable, I think, you know, you need a, both a good source of blue sky revenue, you need a demonstrated value of resilience and determining what that value of resilience can be, you know, can be difficult to qualify, quantify. Um, but and partly it's it's a willingness to pay. How, you know, do people feel like that resilience is is important? How valuable is it? Are you willing to pay a little more? I know for with CCAs, you know, a lot of times building local solar projects, certainly here on the North Coast, uh, we also have some biomass power here that we that we purchase. It's local. Um, it's a little more expensive for us, but the community chooses to do that for the benefits that that those local projects bring to to the community. Um, so. Just if I, I'm probably getting close on time here, I got a couple of slides with a little dense here, which is some key lessons and challenges. I have a few resources and some questions that, uh, that I would pose to somebody thinking about microgrids. I'll just, we'll just skip those, I think, but I'll give you a, a few of the uh, key challenges here. Um, so community microgrid projects are challenging and involve substantial risk. And again, now that we're talking about multi-customer uh, microgrids where a third party is owning the grid forming generation. They require an extremely strong commitment partnership and collaborative relationship between the distribution system operator, your local utility, and the community wanting to, to, to put in a project like that. These are, these are complicated in order to, to be done safely, uh, reliably for the utility to, to meet their, you know, their qu power quality and safety uh, um, you know, requirements and standards, which they're still re responsible for, even in island mode, because it's still their distribution circuit and their customers on that circuit. They're liable, so they need to make sure it's done, you know, to to those utility standards. Um, and so it's it's a really in, integral partnership between those those parties. Um, the community needs strong technical expertise behind them. They need a willingness to take on some risk. They need funding. Um, here's a risk example that that was identified in in, in our project, um, and it's a risk that we've chosen to take. Uh, the microgrid, the RCAM microgrid, is designed and improved for the existing conditions on that microgrid circuit, those 20 retail accounts, um, the, the existing load and any, there weren't really any existing DERs. We introduced a, 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 a NEM DER, but so that microgrid was designed to be able to serve that, those loads in island mode safely and, and, and meeting power quality standards. Um, if load or DERs are added to the circuit, if, if new customers come or existing customers want to add load or DERs, the utility can't just say, no, you can't do that. You know, when, when somebody wants to add load, you know, there may be a cost associated, but basically the people are able to add load to the grid. Um, if there's a load added to, the, to, the, to what's part of the islanded circuit or what can be the islanded circuit, we, need to, we may need to do a, a redo the microgrid islanding study and make sure that that can be done safely and, 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 and reliably 
And if there needs to be upgrades, whether it's to the DERs or to other aspects of the system, those would fall on the community, the community microgrid aggregator. Um, if the community chose, decided they couldn't or weren't willing to, 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 to handle that added cost, they may lose the approval to operate in island mode uh, because it can't, couldn't be done safely or, 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 or reliably. So now there may be other ways, maybe the new customer, you figure out a way that they, if they don't wanna pay for some added stuff, then you isolate them as well, but it, it, it adds some complication and therefore adds risk. Um, so community microgrids with third-party ownership, I think I already said this one's comp a bit complicated. Um, the, the wholesale grid forming asset um, can participate in the KISO market. That's for, for a, a larger community microgrid like this. That's, you know, you might have behind the meter and if you can do NEM systems and help power that community microgrid, all the better. The retail value of that, of that power is, is gonna be certainly higher, but the, you can participate in the KISO market. Um, this is new for KISO as well for, for microgrids and, and, and uh, um, uh, hybrid resources. But um, I'll just say that you know, we're, we're, we've gone through that process and it, it's, it's quite complicated and, 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 and arduous. Um, one of the good things is the, uh, the, when we're islanded, we're still considered in the KISO market and that really, and we'll be RCA will be compensated as such, and that really simplifies things a bit. Am I about out of time here, Eric? Yeah, Jim, if you could just wrap up and we can revisit some of these things and questions. Okay, okay. Um, this, is the, this is the last slide here. So I'll just, um, uh, the, the grid connected operation for a front of the meter uh, microgrid. So the, the two DER resources, the NEM system and the wholesale system, those were, inter those were interconnected under standard tariff agreements, um, the wholesale distribution access tariff and rule 21 NEM tariff. Um, so that, the, that, that grid connected operation is governed by those existing tariffs. The islanded operation is governed by a new community microgrid enablement tariff that was developed along with PG&E and now exists for other community microgrids to utilize um, and the associated microgrid operating agreement that's, that's, that's part of that tariff. Um, I'll say that, that the utility PG&E controls islanded operation. Um, that may, you know, and, and that means both the transition to and from island as well as, so whether that's seamless or break before make and also when you island. That may make may make people uncomfortable um, that they're that they have that control, but I'll say that these projects, the whole idea here is is resilience and with a community microgrid project for critical facilities, and so they they will do everything they can to make sure that that resilience is delivered. Again, if it can't be done safely or you know or to the to, to the power quality standards, then those generators are not going to be allowed to you know to sort of cause problems on on that distribution circuit. So. Um, you know, we don't have any other reason to island other than for resilience, and we're confident that that, that will, will be done uh, under, under pretty much all circumstances. Um, I think I'll leave it at that because I'm, I'm a bit over, and um, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Eric. So thanks for your time, everybody, and, and I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. Great, Jim. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really like I just want to appreciate you and all the partners in laying out uh, a road before us to, and taking on doing hard things and making it easier for the rest of us. So, so thank you for your leadership on that. Um, okay, so be, I just, I wanna highlight a couple pieces uh, before we go into our next phase here. First is uh, you, could, you can tell that there are, there are different pathways that we can take um, in terms of achieving energy resilience in our communities. Uh, Craig Lewis, and Desmond from uh, uh, Santa Barbara School District showed how single site microgrids can be achieved economically and provide uh, numerous co-benefits. And then Jim presented a, a more complex model, one that's really still emerging uh, that um, can provide resiliency um, in an environment where you have multiple sites and resources, uh, local energy resources that are both connected uh, at the distribution grid and behind the meter. And so there's two different models here. Um, and and the, the work that Craig is doing and that Desmond is now in the process of, of implementing uh, demonstrates uh, already viable um, pathways forward. And Jim is laying out a, a, an alternative pathway for these more complex systems. So I just wanna provide that context uh, to sum up these two different case studies. Okay, so with that, uh, before we jump into questions and answers, I just wanna let you all know this, this webinar does go to 1.30, so please stick with us until 1.30. Uh, I think it's gonna be a very 
um, valuable discussion. Um, but before we transfer into uh, questions and answers, I'm going to term, turn it over for a few minutes to Dr. Aaron Pierce, who is the director of the Institute for Climate Leadership and Resilience at, uh, at Cal Poly, uh, to tell us about some potential resources for your organizations and communities to advance local clean energy and community resilience. So Aaron, the floor is yours. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, so there's uh, basically two ways in which we'll be able to provide assistance with microgrid or other decarbonization and adaptation projects, uh, our research collaborative and our fellowship program. So the research collaborative can provide work for an external partner on feasibility or preliminary feasibility studies by partitioning the project into components that fit well in existing courses at Cal Poly. So this could include CEQA analysis, design work, engineering sketches, analysis of existing facilities and modeling of new facilities, uh, trade-off analysis, cost estimates, policy analysis, review of existing literature or community outreach, education, marketing, graphics and communication, social media, public relations, all sorts of things. We have many classes. So examples include, uh, we recently did a CEQA environmental constraints assessment of the Phillips 66 refinery for use as a uh, desalination plant. One class of 35 students produced five reports, each of which was 70 to 130 pages long, so fairly in-depth. Um, Multi-purpose redevelopment comparative analysis of the uh, Phillips 66 refinery was also done, looking at possibilities of regional park, plastics recycling facility, green hydrogen plant, grid scale battery storage, or anaerobic digester facility. Uh, and we're also currently working on a background report for an EV readiness plan. So this includes review of existing code for supporting or potentially conflicting policy and a literature review of existing plans from other jurisdictions. So just to give you a feel for the kind of tasks that the students are able to uh, carry out. Um, analysis can be provided in a quick turnaround time and at a very low cost. There's some cost to set up the project, but since the work is done by students as part of their coursework and by the faculty as part of their normal teaching load, there's no charges associated with labor for the students or the supervising faculty. And the work is carried out within a 10 week quarter. So it's pretty fast turnaround. Um, and student teams working in parallel can develop multiple solutions and cover a very large amount of ground. And students are also excellent at outreach uh, with very high acceptance by community members. So for more information on this, uh, you can go to climate.calpoly.edu and I'll post that in the chat in a moment. Um, the other thing is that for the next couple of years, uh, we have the Californians for All College Corps Fellowship Program. So this is an internship program funded by California volunteers similar to AmeriCorps. Uh, fellows can be placed at nonprofits or government agencies to work on programs focused on climate action, also food security and K-12 education, but we're focused on climate. Um, each fellow is to complete 450 hours of work between July of 2022 and July 2023, uh, with an expected second cohort to run for the following year, again, uh, July to July. Um, fellows must be placed with community host organizations in groups of two or more, and the community host organization is responsible for supplying and supervising 450 hours of work and helping to record various success metrics in terms of uh, tasks accomplished, um, <clears throat> and otherwise it's supported. So projects should help fellows uh, develop 21st century job skills and ideally align with student degree and career objectives, uh, but otherwise can be quite broadly defined. And for more information on that, you can visit the serviceandaction.calpoly.edu website. Uh, and I'll post that in the chat here as well. Um, there you go. OK, that's my bit. Thank you very much. Oh, you're on mute, Eric. Excuse me. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Appreciate uh, all the work you're doing at Cal Poly and these resources uh, being made available to local governments to support um, you know, early exploration into opportunities for local clean energy and resilience and climate adaptation action in general. So thanks for being that resource. Um, before we jump into q and I just want to take a moment to highlight a question. There was a robot, robust conversation happening in the chat around the role of our community choice energy program. And I'll say that uh, Central Coast Community Energy is uh, is moving in a really good direction around distributed energy resource, local clean energy resources and resilience with a front of meter battery storage program and some other emerging programs in that space. However, uh, there are other, uh, as, as Jim Zolik mentioned with Humboldt or with Redwood Coast Energy Authority. And as I mentioned in the chat, uh, East Bay Community Energy and Clean Power Alliance of Southern California, 
there are working in a very active way to help identify these types of facilities like the school districts, like critical facilities, like uh, facilities that serve vulnerable populations and, uh, and actively supporting identification, feasibility uh, and contracting. Um, in some cases, I think East Bay Community Energy is working on upwards of like 200 different sites across their members jurisdictions. And so there is an opportunity for our community choice program to support this type of uh, uh, local clean energy and, and resilience. And we, 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 we'd be happy to work with you all to, um, to, to help uh, Central Coast Community Energy um, do that together with us. So uh, without further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Mark Woods, who's going to uh, facilitate questions and answers. Mark. Thank you, Eric. So uh, we have a number of questions that were asked during chat. And uh, the first one will go to Desmond Ho. Um, this comes from Seth Caprone. Uh, the question is, was the contractual requirement for prevailing wage a policy decision by the school board? And second part of that question is, were there any wage monitoring or other enforcement clauses in the district's contract with the PPA developer? Um, I mean, for us to do any construction project that has to go through a, a formal or informal bidding process, um, any of the construction projects have to be prevailing wage. So for us, we just have to pay for prevailing wage because that's that's our policy. And I think I want to say that's Kupka policy, isn't it? I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, and then in the second part of the question was wage monitoring, you said? That's right. Were there any wage monitoring or other enforcement clauses in the district's contract with the developer? Um, that is a really good question. I don't know. So I'll have to write that down and get back to you because I'm not sure about that. I, I, I don't think there were. I, you know, the clean coalition was involved in this, you know, the whole way through contracting. So uh, prevailing wage was set. That's pretty standard for any municipality, whether it's a school district or a city, county, blah, 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 fill in the blank uh, municipality. It's pretty standard. So uh, prevailing wage is not that big of an economic impact to these projects. And, and, and that, that's pretty standard in a municipality. OK, thank you, Craig and Desmond, for that. Uh, I have a second question that was asked in the context of the Santa Barbara Unified School District presentation. And uh, Craig answered this. Uh, in the chat, but I think it may be worth revisiting here. Um, so the question was asked by Michael Chiakos and as well as Tiffany Westwise. Uh, the question is, with all of the NEM 3.0 changes for solar, how do you expect the economics of a project like the Santa Barbara Unified School District's microgrid to change? And then a second part of that question is, we, we of course don't have the final details of NEM 3.0, but what about the worst case scenario for the proposed decision that was pulled and some midway scenario? Yeah, um, so, so the, the uh, you know, the, I think you, you laid that out nicely, Mark. You know, the, there was a proposed decision at the California Public Utilities Commission, which was terrible for, for net energy metering, uh, referred to as NEM. And, uh, and, and it's, we refer to it as NEM 3.0 because it's the third incarnation of net energy metering in California. Um, the proposed decision was, was absolutely disastrous for residential uh, net energy metering. It was not nearly as bad for uh, commercial and industrial, which is, you know, it, which is the, the, the market segment that the, the Santa Barbara Unified Schools fit into and, and any, any business tariff, like any business, uh, any, any municipality uh, facility is going to be in a commercial and industrial tariff. It's not going to be in a residential tariff. Uh, at least you know, there might be corner cases like they own a house that the you know somebody lives in uh, that works for the for the municipality but in general they're going to be commercial industrial uh, tariffs and the thing that what was the biggest killer on the in the proposed decision for residential was the fixed fees so there were two things that that happened in the proposed decision one they changed the amount of, of reward, essentially the compensation that one would get for energy that was exported off the site to the grid, right? That's called NEM export. NEM export rates, you know, compensation went way down. 
And the other big thing on residential, which did not apply to commercial industrial, was that they also put fixed fees. So, so grid participation fees, I forget the exact name, but they were basically fixed fees uh, per kilowatt of solar, and they were really high. In fact, a lot of a lot of residential. If you had a little bit of shading on your residential uh, deployment, you probably would never earn back your money. You would, you know, they people talked about, oh, you earn it back in fifteen years instead of seven or whatever. It's like double the time. In some cases, it would be never. In, you know, you had to have a really optimal um, solar exposure to actually get any payback um, ever, or to pay back at any point along the way for residential because of those fixed fees. The, the commercial segment didn't have the fixed fees. And the nice thing about um, what, you know, so, so, so the fixed fees were the biggest killer. That was, that was the really big killer on this proposed decision. The, 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 the fact that you could put storage and attach storage to your solar and time shift that, that, that daytime solar instead of sh- you know, pushing it out to the grid and time shift it into the evening and night times when en- energy actually has the highest value, to just self serve your energy into the you know across the night that would you know that would help pay back the batteries that so there were ways to get around the uh, reduction in the um, compensation for NEM export but there were no workarounds for the uh, for for the fixed fees um, the proposed decision has been pulled as mark said so it's not going to it's you know it's it, whatever comes forward next is not going to be as bad. <laughs> it's probably not going to be perfect, but it's not going to be as bad. Uh, and, uh, and, but the net effect is that even if the proposed decision were passed, the net effect on the, the, the Santa Barbara Unified Solar Microgrid projects would have been less than 10% on the economic impact. So they still would have made economic sense in almost every instance. Um, it would have made sense to probably oversize the batteries from what we originally, you know, how we size them. Um, so, 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 you know, the, the, the nice thing about this, um, you know, the changes that will likely come into place is that there's going to be extra rewards for time shifting your solar energy into the evening and night times, which is when California's grid needs energy. And it's when we can save the most uh, for the rate payers, all rate payers, because we can reduce the amount of new transmission infrastructure that's going to have to get built because we're going to get more and more local renewables and other distributed energy resources that make those local renewables applicable 24 seven, instead of just when the sun is shining or when the wind is blowing. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Craig. And uh, the next question is going to Jim Zolich. Um, This comes from Seth Caprone. And the question is, if CPUC tariffs didn't forbid moving power across more than one property line, would the Redwood Coast Airport microgrid be more economically successful if you could have avoided the PG&E community microgrid model by installing your own poles and wires and thereby keeping the whole project behind the meter? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think the certainly uh, in, installing our own poles and wires, uh, you know, a, a redundant distribution system essentially would have added cost to the project. Um, I'll also say that the uh, the um, the equipment required for islanding uh, of of the of the microgrid. So we're talking about uh, a recloser. Uh, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, controls, microgrid controls and communications equipment. Um, I'm not remembering now the total cost of this, but I think it was probably in a couple hundred thousand dollars. Um, that equipment um, under the CMEP program, there's, a, there's an incentive to cover the equipment that's required for, um, for islanding. So, um, you know, that we, that now you could maybe say, well, maybe all that equipment wouldn't have been required. Certainly some of it would have been. Um, I, the place where, so, you know, I, I, I see actually adding cost as opposed to reducing cost on, on that side of things. I think the place where, um, perhaps it could improve the economics is that certainly behind the meter. And I realize you know, with, with NEM 3.0, this, this maybe changes a bit, but certainly behind the meter NEM systems where you're getting the retail value of the, of the power, um, is 
is better economically than selling power on the wholesale market. And so, um, you know, th that would certainly, th if, if all of that generation was offsetting, um, you know, what was valued at the retail rate, certainly that would improve the economics. Um, I, you know, whether or not you could do that if you, I mean, we actually, we, we did a, a microgrid at the Blue Lake Rancheria uh, and we had to make a decision. It was actually our first microgrid project. Um, they had three separate uh, metered accounts, uh, each with their own transformer and, you know, served off of 12 kV distribution line, but all, all on their, their, uh, their Rancheria property. And they wanted to include all three of those in the microgrid. And so that's actually where the concept came up with pg e for the possibility of a multi-customer microgrid. We chose not to pursue it at that time. And instead, the Rancheria purchased the distribution grid, the 12 kV grid, they and the transformers. And there was the point of common coupling or the point of interconnection is at 12 kV. And when that breaker opens, everything downstream is basically is now a single primary voltage account um, on, on pg e system. So everything behind that, um, you know, it, it, there's essentially net metering through that primary meter. Um, you know, perhaps if you, if you could do something like that, that, would, that could improve the economics. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, we have uh, a question that was hey, asked. Hey, Mark. Sorry, can I just check, can I just add in one thing? Uh, you know, the the beautiful thing about what what uh, the RCAM is doing is it's 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 showing a way for how the future needs to be. <laughs> so you know, Jim Jim is uh, doing a favor to the rest of us Californians by suffering through the 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 the, the brain damage that he's had to go through to get PG&E to, to do the right thing and, and to actually put a true community microgrid in place. Um, so, you know, for, for and I, I, you know, I'm on the technical advisory committee for the RCAM project, so I, I feel okay saying this, but, you know, Jim can correct me if, if I'm getting it wrong, but, you know, those guys aren't in it for the economic optimization. They're in it for providing a showcase that the rest of the state can follow. And, and that's the real value that that, uh, that that Jim is bringing. So yeah, there's other ways to you know have worked around some of the brain damage, but then we would we would just have you know kind of the way everybody's been doing it forever. <laughs> so uh, you know, RCAM is bringing tremendous value by being a showcase, doing it the right way that utilities and CCAs need to do things in the future. Okay, great. Thanks so much for adding in on that, Craig. Um, I think we've reached a point where it, it would be, uh, we're just about out of time for Q&A. So rather than ask another question, um, I'd like to transition to the, the next phase of our webinar here, where we're, we'd really like to uh, learn something from our audience, because this is the fourth in, this, in a series of webinars, and uh, we intend to have a fifth and maybe more. Um, so I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Nancy Glock Grunike, who's going to ask some questions from of the audience um, to help us do our planning in the future. Thanks so much. This has been just a really inspiring conversation and it feels like we're just getting started. So what we'd like to check in with you at this point, I've put the questions in the um, in the chat, but it disappeared from the chat. But essentially, I'm interested, we're interested in finding out what you thought was particularly valuable today, what you'd like to see more of in our future series. And also, obviously, what didn't get addressed or topics that you would like to see covered. So you can put your thoughts about that into the chat. And also, um, get into a, a conversation about it. If you wanna open your mics and just speak out, have a bit of a discussion between you. There also will be an opportunity uh, following, I think John uh, Smigelski's address, email address will be available for the follow-up questions and follow-up suggestions. Maybe we can do this by raise of hands. Uh, it seems like the financing, the, the kind of two, two things that come up is like, how do I get started? Like, how do we, how do we get the process moving and how do I pay for this thing? Is, uh, is there interest in folks in us uh, kind of supporting that type of conversation? 
Eric, I'll, I'll just mention one thing, and I, I'm not sure exactly uh, the, the context of that was. So whether you were talking about um, these behind the meter ones like the Santa Barbara School District, but certainly for people who are interested in, in opportunities for front of the meter community microgrids, um, you know, the, the, the open uh, microgrid proceeding with the CPUC, there's a process where the three IOUs are, you know, are developing this microgrid incentive program. Um, and there will be real, real money available. I mean, you have to be eligible if you're just dis served disadvantaged communities, that's going to be to your advantage. You have to be serving critical facilities. Um, but the, the work that RCAM has done to establish a tariff and processes and procedures for these types of microgrids should be transferable to that program. And the, the thing about that program, I mentioned that the CMEP program, Community Microgrid Enablement Program that PG&E started will support, uh, will, will uh, help pay for the cost of, of equipment that's required for islanding. The uh, Microgrid Incentive Program will provide substantial funding for the DERs themselves. So, and that's really where the, where the big co cost is. So I think that's certainly an opportunity that um, is, you know, will, should be available later this year. And if you're thinking of a, of a friend of the meter community microgrid, that's that's an important program to be aware of. Yeah, that, it really seems like um, like now is the time to start some of these earlier get get momentum building, get interest identified, uh, so that we can take advantage of these resources both through these state programs and and potentially through federal infrastructure. Great, Nancy. Other, just one more minute. Just what was especially valuable today? What stood out for you that you'd like to build on? Or frustrating about today? We could hear that too. Looks like we're good, Eric. Right. Okay, great. Well, Nancy, uh, thank you for that. Um, so as we wrap up this, uh, this webinar, first, I just want to um, to bring everybody back uh, to the reason we're doing this. Uh, you know, we're committed to the Central Coast being leaders in uh, climate action and resilience. And we're, we're working through United, uniting the Central Coast for Action to uh, grow a resounding voice of partners um, that are working to, uh, to support um, leadership at our jurisdictions and at our regional community energy program. And so I just want to invite you all uh, to continue to engage with us and let's find ways to, uh, to, um, to, to work together to support that vision. Um, and, and really what underpins that is the, the potential benefits to our community. That means supporting workers, that means supporting um, disadvantaged communities uh, and helping remediate the impacts of, of past environmental justice harms. That means economic opportunities in our communities and that means clean energy and resilience. And so all of those things are possible um, uh, through these types of conversations, and that's why we're here. So I just want to wrap up by thanking you all for joining us. I want to provide a special thanks to all the elected officials and staff who were able to join. And to everyone, we hope that you found this conversation to be interesting and inspiring. I want to thank the speakers for, first of all, your amazing work, and second, for taking the time to share your experience and expertise with us. I would like to thank our co-sponsors for making this event successful. And I wanna give a special thank you to our technical working group for organizing and delivering this ex excellent program, particularly John Spigelski, Jim, Jill Zamek, Nancy Glock-Grunick and Mark Woods who, who led the organizing committee uh, for, this, for this program. And I, you know, as in terms of next steps, look forward to a follow-up from us, including the webinar link past webinar links. We've done a, a previous webinar that actually highlights the work of uh, Clean Power Alliance and East Bay Community Energy in their microgrid leadership. And we'll, we'd love to share that with you. And other information about uniting the Central Coast for Action uh, and how you can partner, how we can partner together. Also, please get in touch with Cal Poly's Institute for Climate Leadership and Resilience for, for accessing student and university resources. So again, thank you so much for joining us. This was a very um, valuable conversation. I really appreciate you all joining us. Please, uh, when you get the, get the information, share it with others who you think will find this valuable as well. With that, I'll bring this conversation to close. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody.